Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for From PMO to VMO. Uh, we're excited here at Azure Rising to team with TaskTop for this webinar. Um, just some procedural things. If you have questions, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A box down below. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and get started with uh, Chris and Wendy here. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for our webinar from PMO to VMO, Accelerating Your Transformation with TaskTop. Viz. I'm Chris Roosh. Uh, I'm a set safe SPCT and I'm the CEO and founder of Agile Rising. Uh, and I specialize in helping organizations adopt uh, agile DevOps uh, and transition to a value stream management approach. And I'm joined today by Wendy Flowers. Hi, everyone. Um, Wendy Flowers. I am a senior value stream architect at TaskTop. Um, I specialize in helping organizations lay out their value streams and realize the value of TaskTop Viz and TaskTop Hub. All right. So what we're talk talking about here today is being focused about value. And we're going to talk about uh, value streams and how we move from a project-based, PMO-based to a value stream-based or product-based um, approach. And what we're uh, we're trying to address here is this challenge that business leaders have today meeting their goals, which are to deliver value faster, achieve their strategic priorities, transform the business model, and do all of this within what's inherently a limited capacity of the organization, and using Agile and DevOps um, to drive change and, and deliver value faster. But there's some common problems that we see in this, um, in this approach. One, uh, it's very common for development to speed up, but not actually seeing the overall delivery of value. Right? And what we end up doing is moving the bottleneck from one part of the organization uh, to, the, to another part of the organization. But it's not really clear where those bottlenecks are. Right? Maybe we sped up technology, but uh, maybe we've now moved the, the problem to, uh, to operations or to security, or maybe the problem is on the business side, right? And if we don't have clear vision um, into how value is actually flowing through our organization, it's really hard to, uh, to determine where that is and to continue to optimize in the right place. And then the question of how much value is actually being um, delivered to the business. And in my conversations with senior leaders and with transformational leaders today, uh, one of the most common um, things that I hear is we've trained everybody in Agile, we've started a transformation, but we don't really know whether it's working or not. What are the right metrics? Um, how do we know that this investment that we're making um, is actually working? So when we focus on value, what we're talking about here is value stream management, identifying our values, our value streams, identifying the products and services and how we deliver value with our, to our customers. So what we're talking about here, the fundamental thing for us to understand within creating a flow-based system, within creating um, an agile or DevOps organization is really understanding how value flows through the organization and what our value streams are. So this isn't really a new concept, right? Value streams are an idea that was developed out of uh, lean um, and the manufacturing sector. And when we apply it broadly across organizations, these exist, right? If you have products, if you have services, if you're delivering value to a customer, um, then you have value streams. Um, and this can be uh, how we go out and market um, and sell to our customers. It can be how we actually develop products. Um, and there's a variety of different ways that we can look at it. But fundamentally, a, a value stream is all of the steps that an organization goes through uh, between somebody asking for something, requesting a new enhancement, um, or placing a new order, all the steps and all the people that go into actually producing that and, and, and delivering it. 
The challenge here is that in many organizations today, these are broken up across different silos. And what we're often trying to do in a transformational effort is break down those silos and really get the, the people and the systems that need to interact working together in a way that has really low friction, low handoffs, um, and allows the delivery of value um, to, to go go through the system really effectively, efficiently, and with high quality. So value streams um, um, are, and, and thinking about organizing around uh, value streams um, really helps you think about how best to organize, how to optimally organize, and how to remove delays and waste uh, through, through the organization. Um, a value stream management approach also helps make it really clear who's responsible for driving that overall end-to-end -end value. And as we get into talking about some of the roles and um, and uh, and and the the way that we structure uh, a value management organization, we'll talk about um, how. Uh, we identify leaders and specific roles and specific skills that will help with that overall end-to-end -end, uh, optimization of the system. It also helps us really align our strategic planning, our funding, and our budgeting with the way that we actually execute and not have different ways of organizing or different ways of thinking about um, how we're going to approach the delivery of value in different parts of the organizations. A lot of what we're going to talk about here is going to be around new product development, but um, this idea for value stream management applies equally as well um, on core IT services, um, on the operations side, and, and with business agility as well. Um, and, and so the, the, to sum this up, a uh, quote here from uh, from Karen Martin and Mike Osterling. If you can't describe what you're doing as a value stream, then you don't really know what you're doing. Um, and this is uh, something that, uh, that we really focus on at the beginning of a transformational effort with a new organization is really helping to understand how value flows throughout the organization. And it's um, really surprising and sometimes eye-opening um, um, how many people we need to get involved in identifying value streams because it's so broken up um, and so siloed across the organization that there really is not a single person that can describe um, how value is being delivered. Okay. So what we're going to talk about here is how we can get to a place where we have real clarity um, uh, about not just how value is being delivered, but about how well we're doing at it and how we can optimize it. But here's the challenge. As we said at the beginning, um, leaders are continually challenged by the fact that agile transformations uh, often don't realize the full benefits, the full promise um, that they were undertaken for. And the reason that that often happens is because we're not looking at the entire value stream that often the agile transformation or the DevOps transformation is focused on specific pockets of technology or product development. Um, and, um, and that results in um, not really achieving what the organization is, is really capable of doing. So this is a, a chart from the latest State of Agile report. Um, this is the 14th annual State of Agile report that came out earlier this year. And one of the questions that was asked in the State of Agile um, uh, survey was, how are you measuring the success of your transformation? And what value is that, uh, that DevOps transformation? Um, uh, yielding. And as we can see here, 70% of organizations saw faster delivery, 62% saw improved quality. But if we look at things like, is delivery aligned to business uh, uh, objectives, less than half of the organizations um, uh, uh, said that that is actually happening. Only 34% of the organizations that replied to the survey said that their DevOps transformation increased visibility of flow and, uh, and of user value. That should be really concerning, right? So if we say 70% of the organizations um, are seeing faster delivery time, but only 39% of them are seeing better alignment with their business objectives, um, that really indicates that 
that we may be building things faster, but we don't really know that we're building the right things and that we're really aligning um, our strategic planning to our ability to execute. Um, uh, even more concerning is the lower number uh, of organizations that are actually seeing flow uh, through the organization. Because right, if, if you're doing a DevOps or, uh, transformation and you haven't increased your flow and your visibility, you've got a problem. Um, you're, you're, not, you're not doing something right there. Um, and so uh, as we go along here and we talk more about how we um, implement flow and flow metrics, um, that's really going to talk about how organizations can significantly increase the value um, and, and, and see these numbers um, uh, rise around the flow of value. Right? So organizations are, are often having a, a number of different transformations and, and what you're calling your transformation um, may be a little bit different than some of the terminology that I'm using. You, there may be a digital transformation, there may be an agile or DevOps um, or uh, a technology business management transformation. Organizations today are, are undertaking a lot of different modernization and transformational um, efforts, but many of them have um, a lot of consistency in goals and approach uh, that are around trying to be more efficient, more effective at delivering value, creating visibility, um, lowering our, our overall IT costs and creating more innovation. So what we're talking about here really applies um, to, to any of these transformations. Uh, it, it applies even more if you have more than one of these transformations going on at the same time, which is very common these days. Because um, when we have uh, multiple transformation efforts, we often have multiple frameworks, we've got multiple approaches, we often have multiple tools across our entire um, value delivery chain, um, that if we are not approaching in a consistent way, and that we're not really pulling together into an overall view of how value is now flowing through the new way that we're organizing the enterprise, um, we're really going to run into those same problems of not having visibility, not aligning um, to our business goals, and not having the visibility into the metrics uh, around what we've accomplished and where we're going. So the takeaway here, um, as we link from um, the, the, the goal of delivering value to our users faster uh, to the flow and, and product-based way of working is that the future of all of our large-scale transformations um, uh, and, and take your pick of what your company is doing, what's gonna make it successful or not is effective value stream management um, and the ability to provide that visibility integration and flow across your organization, um, whatever it is that you're building and whatever um, uh, industry that you are in. So when you're undertaking any transformation effort, it really is a change initiative. And there's a, a quote here from, from Andy Warhol. I'm, I'm based in Pittsburgh, so I like to, to call out to our fellow, fellow Pittsburghers. Um, they always say times change things, but you actually have to change them yourself. So what we're going to talk about with the rest of this talk is really giving you the tools um, in order to implement change in your organization um, and um, the approach around organizing around value with a, uh, with a VMO, a value management um, office, so that you can drive the change in your organization. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Wendy to go into more detail. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, so as we go through, I actually have had a really good um, experience this past, oh gosh, since 2018, and I'll go into that a little bit. But what I've been able to ascertain throughout this past couple of years is why we need to go through a value stream approach. And one of the things that I've been able to do is our CEO, Dr. McKearson at Tastop, um, he gets to go out and talks to all of these amazing leaders and all of these amazing organizations. And I happened to be with him one day 
And we were driving and I said, you know, one of the things is this is a huge opportunity to bring IT out of the shadows. And I actually do an entire conference talk about this. But the gist of this is that the value stream organization and when you're when you're moving to a value stream organization, you truly have the opportunity to bring the business into the fold and really start to look at things from an end to end perspective, as opposed to just what we're delivering from an IT perspective. And because with that, you know, IT, our job is to create business value. And if we're not creating business value, we're really not doing our jobs as IT professionals. We want to make sure that we're creating that end value for the business as well as our customers so that they can get things into production. Um, I have a story about there was an organization that I worked with many, many years ago and everything got stopped in QA. Their development would get done and everything got stopped in QA. In the QA, it would sit there for at least 30 to 60 days. And we all know with IT how much things change. So we need to be a little bit more flexible and agile with that. But just knowing where that bottleneck was allowed them to make changes in their organization so that they could get that business value out a little bit faster. The other thing with the value stream approach too is that the teams are in it from a long haul. You know, think about way back when, when it was, we did a project and from that project, we started with the beginning, we had an end, we released something and then we moved on to the next thing. And you lost a lot of that expertise if there needed to be enhancements or anything along with those lines. When you have this value stream approach, you're looking also at the entire product value stream. So what is that end to end product? And that expertise stays with the teams as well as, you know, they get a little bit more invested with it and they truly become a partnership with the business. And the last thing is something that's really come out with COVID this year. I mean, we're all impacted by it, but there's this digital revolution disruption going on. And what it comes down to is this is actually a graph from 2006 to 2016. And in it, it starts to show us what impact Amazon had during this time frame. Their stock and their um, market take grew 1900%. And then at this point in time, Sears had actually just declared bankruptcy. Again, this is a little bit of an older slide. I've tried to get it updated and I can't find anything quite as impactful. But you know, since then, Sears has gone out of business. So think about the impact now and what we're starting to look at. And we're really probably not going to be able to see these metrics until next year. But during COVID, everybody's getting everything delivered. Target, Kohl's, Macy's, they've all had to come up with this curbside pickup. And a lot of that relies on their IT platforms to be able to do that development. So the question is, you know, are we in this really big revolution? And Carletto Perez says, absolutely. We are absolutely in this IT revolution at this point in time. And what it comes down to is that for each revolution that's been out there, there's a turning point. And this is where these little turning points are, are where the little dotted lines are within there. And right now with the turning point that we're in, you have kind of this creative destruction. Oh, my slide moved a little bit too fast, but this creative area, and now you have this wealth generation. So, oh goodness, a little bit of control issues. Welcome to technology. Um, but as you go through, you have the FANG folks where you're going through and with that, I need it to stay on this slide for two seconds. Um, we're potentially, is COVID striking the turning point for what's going on with the technology revolution? And our CEO actually wrote a blog about this. And we truly think that we're in this turning point because so many companies have had to work from home. So many companies have had to change their platform. And if you think about when project management came into play, it was during kind of that 1890s era, you know, and how many things have changed so much since then. So as companies have gone through and they establish this, they need to start to make these changes to adjust with the times. Um, and one of the other talks I give is I talk about, you know, look at the telephone and, you know, I ask companies, what if, what if Alexander Graham Bell's telephone, we just said, that's great. He invented the telephone, the project's done. We're not doing any more innovation on this valued product. We would still all have operator boards and switchboards, and we wouldn't have our awesome phones that are in our hands for most people. Although I just found out a friend who still has a flip phone. 
Um, but as you go through, you know, you now have our phones, most smartphones have more capacity and more computing capacity than the first computer. So as we go through and what we've seen in the industry is the problem is, is that the principles of software delivery of modern software delivery approaches, they're not translating to the business. We are acronym heavy. We are going through and essentially when we walk into the business, we're telling them how it's made. And I often, um, during a, a podcast that our CEO did, and I can't remember which one, but one of the folks said, you know, when the accountant walks into the room and says, the books are closed, this is how much money we have left over for the year, or we're in the red, or we're in the black, or whatever, you don't really care how the books are closed. It's the same thing going to business when it comes to how are we doing this development? They just want to know about the value and how that translates. So our CEO wrote a book, and this is not just all about his book, I promise, but it is about the flow framework and how the flow framework came into be. Because at Task Top's core, what we are is we actually do a lot of, we do integration. We have an integration platform. And we saw, Mick saw all of this data that's just flowing between all of these. And he's like, what if we could harness that? What if we could see where things are flowing end to end and kind of how do we create this value stream network and these value stream metrics. So he wrote the book Project to Product and it was released in 2018. And during that time, we also internally said, how do we take these flow metrics and get them into a place where teams can start reporting on them? And how do we get into this value stream management, this new way of managing your software deliveries um, in, you know, forecasting on, you know, the products and their value stream. And again, this is where the flow framework approach came into play. And the top half of the flow framework is going to be your value stream metrics in your value stream, um, your value stream network. And these are what provides um, the visibility. Then at the bottom provides the path. How do we get this stuff end to end? So I'm going to talk a little bit about this today. And we're going to talk about the two products that go with this as well. Now, in order to do the flow framework, do you have to have these? Potentially not. We're going to tell you that it's going to be a little bit easier. Um, but the whole thing with this is that the flow framework is a complement to any one of the current methodologies you could be doing from safe to agile to scrum to lean to dad to less it doesn't matter we complement all of those so as you go through what viz is going to provide you and chris mentions you know one of the things is that there's really no true way to measure things right now so what it is is it's going to provide you a prescriptive flow metrics up to that business level visibility so you have this live value stream visualization that records how the work is progressing, how and that you can go through and you can model these different things um, from the view of the products in the portfolio. And then you also, you can replay history to see what's really cool is we actually, um, one of the, the things that I do at TaskTop is we do tool network assessments during while we're implementing some of the biz information. And we can help you run experiments. And so that's where you can replay to go, hey, what if this status is actually our done status as opposed to an active status? So you can experiment and see how things could happen differently based on how you manage your value stream. So this is actually a screenshot of Task Top Biz. And in here, you're going to have, you're going to have the different um, areas, the different flow metrics, as well as you're going to see um, the flow distribution, which is actually not a metric. Mick and I have this discussion all the time. But your flow velocity is going to tell you um, how much has closed during your time frame? Because we can do this on individual time frames. Your flow load is actually whether or not teams are thrashing from the aspect of, you know, think about how many times throughout the day you context switch because you have to go find different information or, you know, something's not where it needs to be or you get stuck, you know, you have to go to run to this one meeting because you're doing requirements gathering or you're talking to someone else about the requirements as opposed to having that information to flow. The other thing is that with the flow load and the flow velocity, we can start to see where you have neglected work. And that's something that's really interesting because how many times does the squeaky wheel get the grease or you, know, you just have escalations just, that just flow in. I hear that from a lot of organizations. 
then your flow time is going to be how much time elapses from the request to the release. What is that full end-to-end -end picture? Not what is just development time, but what's that full end-to-end -end picture? And your efficiency, this one's really interesting because this is a lot of times where we see how you're processing and how efficient your, um, your value stream is. And what the interesting part about this is that then when we look at your flow load, we can also, we have the capability to look at bottlenecks. And so where we go from here, and I'm going to talk about the bottlenecks in just a minute, is that you start to be able to, you know, with the value streams, you're going to have these questions. How long did it take to get through the value stream? How much wait time was there for defects? And what's the distribution between the defects, risks, and debt? The distribution is so key. So what happens is as you go through, you can start to answer these questions with task.biz. So looking at this, um, when you go through, and one of the things that we say is that there's four main um, artifact types, meaning not features, epics, risks, um, bugs, whatever it might be, change requests. Really, this is how we classify within Viz, the four different, and you know, Mick worked with um, folks like Gene Kim and Dean Leffingwell and you know, some of the Agile folks to come up with, there's really four um, work items. There's the feature, which is gonna be anything that's a new business. Um, there's gonna be the defects, kind of self-explanatory, your bugs and your issues. There's gonna be your risks. And risks and debt are so important and we often forget about them. And I've seen this so often when I come to organizations of, and we're starting to do transformations with them. And they're like, we're not really tracking risk and debt. We don't really need to. And I'm like, have you had a security breach? Um, is, are you getting so many defects because you haven't upgraded your systems because you haven't addressed that technical day? Have you not refactored and your code is all spaghetti at this point in time to where when you, when you enhance one thing, you're breaking 12 other things. That's addressing the debt. That's making sure you have a stable background. Then you also have your risks in there and your risks are gonna be your security compliance. What are your risk officers? You know, sometimes people will find those folks, you know, as if you ever read the Phoenix Project, the, secure, the poor security guy in there, um, everybody thinks, you know, he's driving everybody crazy, but at the same time, he's like, we've got to do this or we're gonna have breaches. And then you're gonna lose all this data and it's gonna cost you millions of more dollars as opposed to if we just took a timeout and addressed some of these things. So as you go through one of the things, and this is actually one of the stories that we have from one of our customers, and this is revealing the hidden cost of tech debt. So as you go through and you're taking a look in here, when you look at Task.Top Viz, we have everything is color coded. Your green is going to be your features, your red is your defects, your yellow is your risk, and your purple is debt. And if you look in here, there's no debt. The, in this, when they came to us, we're like, this is incredibly concerning at this point in time, because what will start to happen is you get into a death spiral where every time you do a new feature, you break something. So you get all of these defects to where eventually that flow distribution ends up being all red. And when you have that happen, it's really hard to get out of that point in time until you take a pause and you address everything that you need to. So what they found is that when they, we started to investigate the flow load, we saw that features are just sitting and waiting for really long periods of time. And as we went through a little bit more, we started to take a look at, um, to find our bottlenecks. And what that did is that we constantly reveal those core bottlenecks. And what we found was that for them, it was the core backend services, and it was a huge legacy constraint that they knew that they had, but nobody could really pinpoint why or how. But with this, we were able to take that data and say, you know, this is a data-driven analysis. This isn't like a gut feel. This isn't, we think, this is a data-driven analysis to say, here's where your bottleneck is. Once they can start to clear that up, they can start to see, you know, what is going on? We need to slay this monolith. We need to start to have those conversations of how to move this forward, or we're never going to be able to compete in the industry because we're constantly going to be fixing things as opposed to pushing new things out to the um, to our customers and pushing new um, new technology out and new capabilities out to, to the end customers. So the importance of these flow metrics is that they're tied to the business value. 
they're tied and they're based on um, business outcomes and they're based on, you know, they provide that feedback loop to those decisions. Because as we went through with this customer and we said, you need to start addressing that tech debt and have a little bit more balance they started to see they had better quality of their code. And yeah, it was a little painful up front, but as you go through, you had a little bit better quality of their code that's in there. Um, I see a question in the chat of what's the relationship of the value stream, value chain, business capabilities and product. Um, can you give me a standard an example of a standard value stream structure for, in a specific sector? Um, so one of the things that we can do is, of course, we can talk to you offline about this, but your value stream and how you structure it is all going to be up to your organization. There's not really a standard out there. And, and you know, Chris and I can talk through with you about this because it depends on each organization. Um, we do work with a large insurance company and we actually have them um, laid out by, you know, if it's their finance area, if it's their um, auto insurance, if it's their annuities. And so we can base things off of there and we can group them different ways as well. But that's one of the things that um, our teams will go through and we work with organizations on how to um, how to structure those value streams. It could be going with a product or it could be going with business capabilities and it's, it's gonna be what's best for your organization. There is no magic wand, I'm sorry. Um, to go along with this, so that's kind of the task top biz area. And then there's also, so task top biz is gonna be seeing where your bottlenecks are. Now task top hub is gonna to start to talk about, you know, what do we need to do to fix those bottlenecks? How do we flow this information? Because one of the things that we see with the bottlenecks and in the industry that I've seen and when we've gone in with customers is that their bottlenecks are not so much about they're stuck in one place, but they're stuck in one place because I was working on something and I marketed as completed, but Chris hasn't gone into the system because he and I work in two different systems that he knows that this is completed. So that's one of the other areas that we see bottlenecks. The other thing is that, you know, understanding your integrated value stream along with those bottlenecks and having that traceability end to end so that you can see that total value. So this is an example of, you know, how you could start to think about this. You start it with the business and, you know, take your tools out of the picture at this point in time. Just think about how the information flows, kind of, you know, those old fashioned flow charts that we used to all do. Um, where are your decision points and, and how do they flow through? Keep it as simple as you can. We do workshops around this and sometimes they'll, you know, we'll take up an entire wall with this. But what we want to do is we want to keep it simple and keep you focused on, we're going to take one artifact and we're going to flow it through and what it looks like. And what that starts to look like from a task top perspective for us is then we start to put that into the tools. And this is where you start to identify your tool network. What does your tool network look like? And the red lines is, our, how, are, how is information flowing? Then you start to get into what are those artifacts? You know, what are those models that we have in there? We have our feature models, we also have our defect models. And then that'll start to move you into what are those true artifacts that are moving? So in ServiceNow, I might have a request that then goes into that's actually now Microsoft um, Azure DevOps um, instead of ESTS. I need to update that name. Um, but you can go through and that's going to flow in as a feature. Then that's going to flow into Jira as an epic as well. So you're keeping that information, that data in sync so that then, you know, the business that put in that request, they have visibility to it as well. And this goes back into bringing your business into the fold and bringing them into the value stream. Because the other thing that can happen along the way is as you go through and between biz and hub, you can start to see what those trade-offs are. If the business comes to you and says, hey, I need this right now. Okay, that's great. But in order to do this, because so many times I've had the business complain that, hey, IT is not getting stuff done as fast as we want, but IT is saying, wait a minute, they're telling us everything's priority number one. So this is where we can bring everybody together to start to say, what is your true top priority, but what is the trade-off if we do those things so we can combine those things together? This is an actual screenshot of Tasktop Hub. Oh of Tasktop Hub. And with those, what you start to see is you start to see that landscape view. And this is actually Tasktop on Tasktop. Um, I don't know why that keeps going forward. But as you go through and you start to see it, you can see how the information is flowing. So, you know, this is how we get that end-to-end -end value stream within Tasktop as well. 
So some of the value stream architecture principles is architect and integrate um, for flow and speed of delivery. So that's going to bring us to, sorry, um, but that's going to bring us to, you know, how do we make sure that we have that end to end? So not only is it, you know, like um, the question was, was, you know, what is that value chain and capabilities, but what is also your tool network and what does that look like? And how do you have that end to end flow? You know, Chris was talking about during the state of agile report, they're looking at the flow and speed of delivery. How are we getting that out there? And how do we know that we're doing the right thing? The other thing is, as you go through here, is that you want to implement the flow metrics. So what you should also be thinking about is, you know, you can look at a report in JIRA and you can look at a report in ServiceNow, but those are just giving you those snippets of time. What's happening in JIRA? What's happening in ServiceNow? What's happening in ALM? What's happening in any of the tools that you're using at this point in time, as opposed to what does that end-to-end -end look like? What does that entire end-to-end -end value stream metrics look like in those flows look like? The other thing is that when you utilize the metrics in retrospect, ask what's slowing us down and how can we go faster? The one thing that I tell organizations is this should never ever be a punitive exercise. This should be how is we in a, as an organization, how can we get better? How can we move forward and what roadblocks can we remove as leaders and as PMOs, VMOs, so that our teams can get more business value out to our customers? Replace the request response service levels with self-service. You know, see where you can go through and do some self-service things as opposed to, you know, going through and saying, this is our service level agreement. We can't do some of these things. But having this allows you to go through and sit down and say, you know what, you can go ahead and you can change your password. Um, so you don't have those incidents flowing through or even put the request in on your own from the business perspective, instead of having to go through the whole charter and business justification and whatnot. And that goes into you know, some of the funding as well and how you're funding those value streams. And then create continuous improvement initiatives is so key because just because you get to where your bottleneck is resolved, you might uncover another bottleneck. You will never, you will, what we usually tell folks is they're like, we have to get rid of all of our bottlenecks. I'm like, that's not possible because some things will always take the time that they're going to take. It takes paint time to dry. You can't speed up that process. You could put fans on it. Yes, of course, and speed it up a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's still going to take the paint time to dry. So we talk about that a lot in that story because um, in Mick Spilkey talks about that story with BMW and how they had to optimize to actually paint drying their end-to-end -end flow and how do we work around it? So it's not necessarily alleviating those bottlenecks, but how do we work within those constraints and make sure that we're allowing our value stream to flow but not just saying, oh, well, there's a bottleneck, so we can't do anything about it. No, it's optimizing for that bottleneck. So then we get to those value stream answers of how long did it take for this feature to go through? And you can start to see that end to end. How much time was waiting there? So that's again where you can start to see that in that flow in those flow metrics. And what's the distribution? And I, I, if you ever talk to me on the side and you hear me talk about distribution, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about it um, because the whole thing is is that you have to focus on all four work item types because otherwise you're gonna fall into just you know getting into that death spiral. And the other thing is too is it wears on your teams. And that kind of leads us into, you know, moving from that PMO to VMO and how you can help with this transition and how you can help those teams as well. So um, our Kristen Bidoff is actually um, the director of our flow advising team. And in one of, um, in a blog that she wrote, making your product centric work, you know, she said to transition from a scope based outcomes to value based outcomes, it makes sense that the PMO transition as well. So you need to make sure that as you're going, you're evolving yourself. Um, I will tell you, and when Chris and I were preparing for this, I'm like, Chris, I used to run a PMO. Um, I used to be the director of a PMO. I was a project manager for many, many years. Um, I kind of fell into agile coaching. Um, and then from agile coaching, I have followed and fallen into this position, which I actually absolutely love. Um, not that I didn't love agile coaching, but as I go through and when I'm working with these organizations, it's, 
it's you have to evolve and go. And my husband will tell you most probably, I'm a little bit, I, I have that true project management in me of we are command and control a lot of times. And it is an asset um, to have that command and control, but that's, there's also having that flexibility to realize, you know what, my control that I'm going to do now is I'm going to control what's within my control. And that's going to be to help my team's transition to this value stream. So what I've been seeing is what are the potential roles within the VMO? So what we're, what Chris and I are both seeing are these different roles that are coming out. And the really cool thing is that you can define some of these within your organization. They don't have to be written for you. These are just things, you know, suggestions that we've seen. So I'm going to talk through a couple of them and then I'm going to pass it back to Chris. But the one thing is what I do, it's a value stream architect. You know, I study the bottlenecks and I look at the theory of constraints. If you've ever read the goal and the goal actually was a predecessor for, um, uh, the Phoenix project. Um, I had to read the goal many, many years ago. I was in telecom. And the idea was what are our constraints and how do we optimize to those bottlenecks that I was talking about earlier? You're an influencer. Um, this is probably in the most interesting part of my job, but I work with companies and I get to look at their product backlogs and go, you know what, maybe we need to change how we're thinking about this a little bit. So you're kind of that, that trusted advisor as well. And you're part consultant. You are a part consultant with the product managers because you still need someone to own that product, but you're looking at it from a value stream perspective and you drive to those higher level decisions, you know, about how to do the workflow tooling, what would make more sense and how to get your teams to optimize. The other role that we're seeing a lot is that product journey champion. So it's the person who's like, this is my product. This is what I'm going to focus on. And they help move the enterprise forward. They do more of like a system level thinking. They're looking at the entire project to product mindset and they're optimizing that technology um, for those technology investments, as well as looking at the entire journey of the product that's out there and figuring out how do we need to evolve this and working with the business to make sure you're staying competitive in that market. Then you have your product value stream lead, and we have several of these at TaskTop. Um, they know the product. They know the customers. They're, they're kind of um, the liaison between you know, the product and the customer. So I work very closely with our product value stream leads because I'm talking to our TaskTop customers a lot, figuring out what they need and what they want and how do we get that end product out to them. They also want to make sure that you know, we have objectives to measure that success and we have the staffing and skills. And then it sounds really funny, but they also place an emphasis on team happiness. One of the things in that, if you ever go out and look at Glassdoor, this was really interesting to me. I used to work for a company before I came um, to TaskTop. I worked for a couple different companies. And one day I went out to Glassdoor and I looked at what people were saying about the companies after I left. And you know, sometimes you leave companies for various reasons, but as you go through there, you start to, you know, look at why are people leaving? And there's one organization that I'm working with and they're like, Wendy, we can't retain our talent. And it's because they have a lot of thrashing going on. So between the product value stream lead, the value stream architect, they can actually go through and start to work and figure out what does our team need to keep happy, to be happy. And one of the things is that when you have that happy team, they're going to be produce better quality for you. They're going to produce better for you in general. They're going to be more creative and they're just going to be more passionate about what they do. And, and kind of building on that when, when we're working with organizations and talking about the success criteria for, uh, for how are you going to measure the success of, of a agile transformation or a safe implementation, one of the most important ones that we talk about is that uh, employee engagement, employee satisfaction, because um, it's really a leading indicator. Like a lot of times those, those revenue outcomes, those time to market, uh, those take a lot of time to, to figure out, but your, your people will let you know if it's working sooner as a, as a leading indicator. Uh, so one of the other roles that, um, that, that we see within the, uh, the creation of uh, a VMO or within uh, implementing value stream management as a lean portfolio leader. So in um, the organizations that, that we work with, um, usually this kind of transition 
from a PMO to an agile PMO or to a VMO um, is within the context of implementing lean portfolio management, um, often in connection uh, with scaled agile framework. And so uh, there's a role here that's really focused on that um, strategic planning, the funding budgeting side of things um, that, that aligns senior leadership um, and business and IT leadership to what are the, uh, the strategic priorities and how are we going to align the budgeting and funding to those priorities, which in turn helps us to um, define our value streams and how much we're going to invest in each one of those value streams. So this is a, a role that's very focused on flow and creating flow, but it's creating flow um, at the, the strategic planning level. So, so taking that annual budgeting process and turning it into um, a continuous flow process, um, getting senior leaders involved in the value stream um, and making the feedback loops tighter and bringing in the financial planning, the, um, the lean budget guardrails, uh, determining how we're gonna do CapEx, OpEx and, and those sorts of things um, without uh, making that be some totally separate process from what we're uh, using to actually develop our products. Um, so um, uh, this role is often also um, a leader of the VMO. So as we talk about you know, who actually drives transformation um, in an organization and who implements um, these flow-based uh, uh, metrics, uh, what I want to really reinforce is that the PMO needs to lead the way. Um, a really common anti pattern that I've seen over the years and transformations that I've been involved in is that there's um, a PMO um, that has you know, driven uh, the process and um, and um, uh, and established the current traditional approach. And there's now an agile transformation effort that's often being led by some different group, maybe being driven within technology, um, and um, and is uh, and is not being driven um, by the leadership of the PMO. Sometimes doesn't even involve the leadership of the PMO, and that's a really not a good situation. And like Wendy, I I used to um, lead a PMO. Um, I, I led a, a PMO that won the PMO of the uh, Project Management Company of the Year Award here from our local PMI chapter. So I've got a really strong background um, in, in this area. And I similarly made the transition over to uh, being an agile coach and leading uh, enterprise agile transformations. But unfortunately, what we often see is, is people um, resisting that change or creating these kind of power centers without uh, within a company where some are saying, you know, we're going to go all agile and some are saying, well, we still need to do some things in the traditional way. And they end up instead of collaborating with each other, fighting with each other. Uh, and if there's anything that's going to inhibit flow in an organization, it's people that aren't collaborating. So, um, so what we really want to stress here is that leaders and leaders of um, the existing uh, PMO really need to be the champions that drive the transformation forward um, and that we're not just looking at this as a technological modernization um, or a process modernization for, um, for technical teams, but it's really something for the entire organization. Um, this is also significant change management, right? The, that we're talking about the way people work. We're talking about retitles for, for people and, and things like that. Um, and those aren't things that we can just snap our fingers and make happen. Um, and, and they are things that will create concern and uncertainty about you know, what's the future of my job and, and how do you empower people um, to be able to, to perform on those jobs. So when we talk about this, this value management office, what we're really talking about is modernizing the PMO and moving the PMO function away from a rigid process-driven um, um, requirements and task-driven way of working to 
a flexible organization that focuses on enterprise agility, business agility, and, and really flow throughout the organization and serves a really critical function of driving um, the, the governance around the metrics that we're gathering within the flow framework, right? Gathering those metrics doesn't do us any good if we don't turn them into something actionable and if we're not having that continuous attention to improvement, right? So what we're talking about as we move from a PMO um, to, a, to a VMO is right, we're moving away from project teams and we're moving to long-lived agile teams aligned around value streams, aligned around products, right? If, you're make, if your organization is making a project to product transformation, your, your PMO needs to make the project to product transformation as well. Right? Uh, it's gonna impact our funding because we're no longer gonna fund projects and project cost accounting, we're gonna fund value streams and we're gonna look at, at those long lived team of teams um, and the interconnected value stream um, as, um, as where our funding uh, is gonna, gonna go. And that creates some significant change within the organization. We need to involve finance. Um, we need to think about how that's gonna change the way that we budget, the way that we do our reporting, the way that we do our accounting. Moving from this um, uh, kind of unlimited intake, you know, one of the biggest inhibitors to agility and flow that I see in organizations is that leadership just always says yes to whatever it comes down the line. We're, we're not doing prioritization at the highest level and we're just overloading our teams and people are working on five different projects at a time and they're constantly context switching and we just have too much going on in the system, which you'll see in your flow metrics. Um, and, and our way of addressing that is by limiting work in process, visualizing the work, getting that lean throw, flow through the organization and moving out of the starts and stops of um, starting projects, doing stage gate review type processes, um, work breakdown structures and talking about completion of tasks and moving to this continual delivery of value, demonstrating working product in our, uh, in our reviews and in our demos um, and creating feedback loops around those. Uh, so um, as Wendy talked about, the flow framework works really well with, um, uh, with SAFE, with Scrum, uh, with Kanban, with, with others, one of the things that, uh, that uh, we encounter with most of our large um, uh, enterprise customers, when you get to the strategic portfolio level, when we're talking about leaders trying to drive a transformation across the organization, different parts of the organization are using different frameworks. You're, you're going to have big companies that have some parts of the organization that are using SAFE, some are using uh, Nexus, some are using less, some, some are using Scrum at scale, some are still waterfall, um, and, um, and, and some are using DevSecOps, right? Um, from the leadership perspective, from the portfolio management perspective, from the VMO, and looking at your overall enterprise flow metrics, you need to be able to account for all of those, right? We, we can't have... Um, uh, uh, an enterprise approach that's focused on only one of those frameworks. This is where it all gets rolled up into the real overall business uh, picture for the organization. And that's where it's really important to have something like the flow framework to use tools like Microsoft or like, like Tastop Viz to, uh, to pull together um, across all of the tools that are being used because you're gonna have every one of the major tools is likely being used in some pocket of the company and we can't rely on the metrics that are being produced uh, by those tools um, alone. Right. So uh, how do we get there? Uh, we've given you a lot of information. We've talked about a lot of different um, elements of uh, how you start to transition to a VMO, adopting a value stream management, implementing flow metrics and, um, and task top viz and task top hub. Right? 
these are things that you can't just snap your fingers and, and, and make happen overnight. These are things that you need an implementation roadmap around. And this is a high level summary of some of the things um, that you need to, uh, to take into account. We have much more detailed roadmaps and change management plans and, and guidance to help um, organizations uh, uh, adopt things. And we're not gonna go through um, all of these uh, just for the sake of time, happy to, to you know, if you want more information, reach out to us and, and we can talk about how we structure um, a roadmap and, uh, and go through these in detail. But you, we're really reinforcing here that there's a, uh, that you need a structured approach. Um, you need a change management plan um, and that we can help you develop that. Uh, but if you just kind of rush into this and don't really map out your process, and don't optimize um, how you identify your value streams and how you align your people, what you're gonna end up doing is taking your existing organization with all of its challenges and all of its bottlenecks, and you're just going to reinforce that in a new way of working, right? You really need to create uh, the structure and the process where you're reviewing the current state, you're identifying the future state, and letting your metrics drive where you're making the improvement so that you iterate into um, the better, more optimal organization that you can be. Yeah. So um, the, the, the real challenge here for, for you is um, where do you go, go from next? And, uh, and what I tell you is start your transformation now, right? The, the biggest impediment that there is to making progress um, is doing nothing and just delaying and just accepting the current state. So, um, so to sum up that, that in-depth kind of list of roadmaps uh, on, on the previous slide, um, what you wanna get started is really aligning your leadership around the shared vision, around the goals um, of, of what you wanna accomplish. Um, create an implementation plan um, and an implementation roadmap with a 90-day uh, cadence uh, that really uh, starts producing demonstrable results and progress right away. Um, and a really great place to, to get started with this um, is attending flow training uh, where, where we can go into a lot more detail about um, how the flow metrics work, how you can use um, uh, Viz um, to uh, to, to really get visibility into your organization um, and, um, and get more detail about um, how to start the, the transformational journey in your organization. And with that, I'd like to, to thank Wendy. That, that brings us to the end of our uh, talk and we have a couple minutes um, here uh, to, uh, to answer any questions that you might have. Not sure that we have any questions from the from the audience, so uh, uh, we will be uh, be reaching out uh, after this uh, with copies of the slides, so you will be able to get that. So, in conclusion, I'd like to thank uh, Wendy and Tasta uh, for uh, for joining us and putting on this webinar. Um, Agile Rising is a uh, is a strategic consulting firm that offers scaled agile framework, uh, business agility, lean portfolio management um, uh, consulting. We are a safe gold partner uh, and a TBM partner, and we are a task top authorized reseller. So uh, if you have any uh, further questions or would like any further information about anything that, uh, that Wendy or I talked about, feel free to reach out to us um, and we'd be happy to provide you with more information. Thank you, Wendy, and thanks everybody for attending our webinar today.